Welcome back, one and all, to day number two of Digital Marketing Europe 2023. Hopefully yesterday was all you were seeking and more. We had amazing discussions, plenty to go around. In fact, across multiple channels, we had a lot of talk, of course, uh, at ChatGPT to open up the day and end the day. AI was on people's lips. Hopefully, you can have a little bit of that as well as mixing in some other brilliant areas to talk about in day number two. First of all, just a shout out to everyone who is tuning in bright and early. I know it is early, so I will not shield too much here. We've just got one big shout out to go towards our knowledge partner packet company if you guys are looking to get your hands on some free ebooks be sure to rate these sessions leave comments throughout the day and definitely interact the q a sections it will increase your chances of getting some free goodies and i mean i just put the word free in there so what more could you want now of course we have got plenty of more talks to take place on day number two i want you guys to remember although the day does open up with a single track here we have four different unique tracks going on all at once throughout the day. So make sure you check in on what's happening elsewhere. You might be missing a talk that really has your interest. And remember, if you are a paying ticket holder, you will have access to all those VODs later on after the event. But I would like to get us started. I would like to remind everyone to definitely keep an open mind and definitely engage the discussion. And remember, the discussion does not stop here. Use this as an opportunity to talk to people, reach out to them, network beyond what you're seeing here. But now I believe it is time to open our day with our first keynote speaker. It is my pleasure to introduce a dapper gentleman. I love the fact he's got the waistcoat. He's set and he's ready to go. It's the one and only wonderful Chris Simmons. Chris, honestly, first of all, thank you for joining me in the tie game. All right. I, I was feeling uh, a bit alone here. I feel I feel like a kindred kindred spirit right here. Absolutely. You've definitely outdone me with the beard, though. I can't match that, <laughs> which is why I must now forfeit the stage to you so you can talk to us about the power of critical thinking. Wonderful. Hello, everybody. Um, hopefully you're having a nice big coffee this morning. Um, sadly, I'm not going to talk about ChatGPT and AI, hopefully, um, mainly because that's not what we're here to talk about. Um, what I want to talk about today is the power of critical thinking in your digital marketing teams. Um, keep an open mind throughout this, this, this talk, because I think there's quite a lot of things that will kind of blend in and overlap over time. And you'll get uh, to you'll get to know um, that where this kind of slots into your work. So I'm going to flick over to my slides now, and you'll see everything in all of its beautiful OMG coloured glory, and uh, and we can get going. Um, the one thing that I like to sort of say up front here is that critical thinking can uh, it is a superpower in 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 business. It is a superpower in agencies. It's a superpower in marketing. It's also something that is a, one of the first principles towards negotiation. It's one of the first principles towards essentially getting what you want out of people and out of life and out of situations. Now, I'm not saying use it for evil. Try and get your your partner uh, to, to 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 do something you don't want them to do, that they don't want to do, or try and get someone to do something that they shouldn't do. But you can use these techniques to sort of pre-think uh, a, a good kind of discussion uh, up front. So very brief uh, bit about me. Uh, I'm the founder of the OMG Center. We support digital businesses uh, in growth, mentorship, and uh, general support for leaders along the way. Um, little QR code up there. We'll show you that later. If you, you know, get in touch with me at the end of all of this. But um, I'm quite eager to get started. Uh, I feel that agendas are for dummies, so I'm not going to do um, loads and loads of uh, we're going to talk about all of these things because you'll know what's going to happen and then you'll tune out. Um, bullet points also kill kittens, so I will do my best not to kill any. Um, and I'll do my best as well to try and make this as fun as possible. Um, it's very difficult, as you can imagine, doing a presentation where you can't see any of the lovely faces that are probably sitting there right now with a nice warm cup of coffee um, and, uh, and, and you know, some smiles. So please do make sure that, you know, you, you're, you're keeping, keeping in touch in the comment section. Uh, ask some questions as we go, and I know that they'll be pulled up at the end for some Q&A. Um, so where do we start? Um, I'll, I'll start with some questions for you. So how many times a week do you have a kind of uh, moment? You know, something's kind of gone wrong. Something means that you have to act immediately. Something becomes important and urgent. Um, I'd argue that from everyone's perspective, even if you're an expert critical thinker, an expert planner, there is at least one of these in a week. You kind of go, ah, bloody hell, I've got to now do this thing. Another question for you. How often have you thought about whacking someone around the back of the head with a keyboard? 
I'm not saying that you should do, but you might have thought about it. Now, usually in these cases, it's when someone probably did something in their own way and didn't sort of communicate properly or someone did something that they shouldn't have done or they just didn't do something. And quite a lot of the time, you kind of wish that, you know, they'd acted in a different way. We're all from different places. We've all had different experiences. We've all had different education, cultures, parents, upbringing, etc. We can't all be in each other's heads. And this is where critical thinking and challenging the, in the right way can come in. Um, and hopefully you'll feel like you need to do this less. So promise, this is the last question I'm going to ask you. How often do you wonder why someone didn't ask for help and but then still kind of messed things up? Now, that happens quite a lot in digital marketing because there isn't kind of a, a perfect yes, no, this is the right way, this is the wrong way answer in many senses. Um, there's also um, uh, you know, a, a, a sad aspect of ego in the industry where it makes it hard for people to come to ask for help. But with the right open-mindedness in a business, uh, especially from a digital marketing point of view, um, you can really get um, uh, you can really avoid these kinds of problems happening. People should be coming to you with a with a challenge to your own ideas as much as coming to you for advice on what they're trying to do. So if you answered yes to some of these questions, you've probably got a critical thinking problem. And um, those problems are not your problems solely. They're part of a team. You're all a kind of an organism working together. Um, so, you know, what is critical thinking? You might think you know what it is. And if you do, Great, but sit here because, you know, there may be something that we uh, we discover together. Um, critical thinking is um, not process thinking. Process stuff is logical. It's kind of this happens, then that happens. And if this happens, then do that. And if that happens, do this. Critical thinking um, is uh, is a very different aspect, a different type of thinking around here. So process thinking is how things get done. Getting things done has gaps in the thinking because you've got tick lists. You're just doing robotically a to-do list. Processes aren't very creative, though. You often end up having something kind of boring or it's very monotonous or it just loses a little bit of value. And with marketing in particular, more creative usually means more valuable. Um, creativity, though, requires thinking and it requires thinking outside of processes but thinking can get people whacked around the head with keyboards. So hopefully, throughout the next few minutes, we'll be able to um, build some processes in our heads that allow us to uh, do critical thinking um, in a kind of autonomic way that helps allow extra value in the processes that, that we deliver in digital marketing teams. So again, what is critical thinking? Critical thinking is kind of the, the so what. It's the the what now, the next, the, the, the then what, um, it allows you to slow thinking down. Um, one of the things that uh, my grandmother used to say was, less haste, more speed, Christopher, uh, which essentially meant don't rush, but go fast. You can go fast by going slow. And that sounds really counterintuitive. But if you're doing a lot of thinking up front, which slows, process, slows the, the outcome or the reaction down, quite often the thing that you react to later is actually uh, a lot more fully formed. It's less likely to upset anyone. It's more likely to, 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 to be supportive. It's more likely to help people. It's more likely to help you get the outcome that you need. So it's kind of like the questions you ask internally and maybe out loud with some of your team members um, before, during, and after a process it allows you to uncover an awful lot of um, uh, depth that you might not have thought of if you rush into a decision and be reactive. Um, if it's not a big part of your working life now, it really ought to be. Um, and after today, it absolutely should be. And if you need any help at the end of all of this, there's the little link at the bottom. You can get in touch with us and you know ask any questions you want if you missed the, the opportunity where, uh, with the Q&A later. Um, so <laughs> what is critical thinking again? Well, if... Willem Dafoe will calm down. I'll let you know. So I always think of it similarly to like the journalistic style, the who, what, where, when, why, how. And if you can, if you want to take a screenshot of this um, uh, when you um, uh, when you're done, put it on a on a little printout, stick it on your desk, however you want to remember it. I always think of it as who, what, where, when, why, how in my head, because it allows me to kind of cycle through a series of questions which I can ask of myself or of my team 
and it helps me to understand whether or not I've fully formed my thinking. So let's just go through some of these, for example. So from a who point of view, you might ask, who benefits from this? Who's this harmful to? Who makes decisions about this? Or who will be best to consult on this? So asking things like, who benefits from this will allow you to decide things like, is it actually ethical? Um, who benefits from this will help you understand, um, is the outcome that I'm aiming for actually going to benefit the person that is supposed to or the people that is supposed to, whether that's clients, more sales, or whether that's an actual end user? Um, who will be the best to consult on this it actually is a really important question to ask, because if you're given a brief by a client, you might actually think, hmm, I might need to consult with their sales team or their product team or their marketing team or someone else other than the person just giving you the brief. What type questions? Things like what are the strengths and weaknesses? What is another perspective? Um, what is the best and the worst case scenario? And what beco could become a blocker here? Best and worst case scenario are different to strengths and weaknesses. Strengths and weaknesses allow you to um, uh, decide uh, different alternative ways of doing the same thing, whereas the best and the worst case scenario allow you to communicate effectively anything that might not work out as well as, as, as you'd hoped. So what is another perspective is a great question to ask if you're looking at it from, a, um, from, the, uh, from the perspective of uh, you're delivering something creative because you're in your own head. You might have a, a, an idea that's different to someone else, but someone who is in your team, someone who you work with, they might have a different perspective, which actually adds into a strategy that you're producing or something creative that you're producing. What could become a blocker here? Now, if you're not asking these sorts of questions when you're building a strategy or building a plan or building something creative for a client or even internally, um, you, you just don't know whether or not um, you might send something for approval and that person's on holiday or it might need to go through several layers of approval. So what could become a blocker here? Well, we're delivering something very creative to a client or it's something that has a lot of technical aspects to it. And then the dev team um, are slow to react because they've got an, an, a, a, a workflow in, in three sprints time you'll, you might get looked at. Or the, um, the actual owner of the business needs to approve something. Where can we get more information? Where are idea, uh, areas for improvement? Where are similar concepts in use and where will this idea take us? If you're looking from a where can I get more information point of view, you should be looking like, okay, I've got the brief. I know exactly what I'm doing. I know exactly how to act. I know exactly who to consult. I know what other perspectives are. Where can I get more information that will allow me to do the best job I can do? Fine, it might be Google Analytics, it might be Search Console, it might be Google Ads, it might be a, a, um, a keyword tool of some sort, but it also might be interviewing people, it might be asking human beings, human being-like questions. And a question which doesn't get asked often enough, especially in digital marketing, because it goes so fast, because you're almost kind of project to project, issue to issue, thing to thing, where will this idea take us to? That's really important to ask, because you should be setting, okay, here's the goal at the end of things, at the end of doing this thing, this is what we're aiming for, but what's next? What happens once this is done? Once this is done, is it done forever or do we need to come back to it in several months' time? Once it's done, do we need to, um, uh, does that trigger another action? Does that trigger another piece of work? Does that trigger something um, that someone else needs to do? Where will this idea take us to? Can also then suggest other ideas that allow you or your client to, um, uh, uh, to, 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 to bring on another team or to do something else that is a step away from what you've just done. Now, you can add so much more value to clients, especially these days when you know, money's tough to come by and clients may well want to look for cheaper or better alternatives. You can add value by saying, this idea will take us to the next step. The next step is this, and this is why you should stay with us because we've thought so far ahead. When type questions, when could this cause an issue? When is the best time to take action? When should we ask for help on this? When will we know this is successful? I, when is the best time to take action? You know, it's not necessarily the best time to take action to put a new website live on a Friday afternoon, for example. It might be that you don't take action on something because someone who is a blocker may well be on holiday or maybe that it's not the best time to take action because the person that benefits from it is in some kind of... Um, uh, uh, may maybe it's it's Christmas time and you're you're launching something you think is the best time to take action, but actually the audience are on holiday because 
they're with their families and things like that. Um, when should we ask for help on this? If you know what your strengths and weaknesses or your best and worst case scenarios are, and you know where you've got all the information that you need, and you know who to consult on, then uh, consult on something, you should then be able to um, identify points in your strategy, points in your workflow when you might need to ask for help or when you should be asking for help, which stops you from or stops your teams from kind of pushing ahead and kind of hoping for the best. If you know at certain points you might need to ask for help, you can say to someone, hey, this might be a blocker here. Can I consult with you on this to get some more information so that, uh, you know, in three weeks time? <coughs> Excuse me. So why why questions are, are like I always think about, you know, the kid in the backseat of the car asking why the sky's blue, why, why, why kind of thing. Why get so much more down into the kernel of the, the issue, kernel of the truth? So why is this a problem to challenge? Why is the best this the best and worst case scenario? Why has this been uh, like this for so long? Why have we allowed this to happen? Um, why is this a proper problem to challenge? is a really good question to ask, especially if clients are coming to you with ideas or with projects. Um, you don't ask them up front until you've done all of this thinking yourself because you want to be able to present uh, an alternative challenge. And we'll talk about challenging shortly. Um, why is this a problem to challenge is super, super, super important. Um, you, you can use resources much more effectively if you are challenging the right problems. Now, it doesn't mean that this isn't the right problem to challenge. It may mean that by asking why is this a problem to challenge, you identify that actually there's a better time to take action, which allows you to work on something else that isn't a blocker in the future. Uh, why have we allowed this to happen? Hopefully you don't have to ask that kind of question if you've gone through the right processes throughout your, you know, your, your work. But if you're asking why have we allowed this to happen, um, something hasn't happened correctly, which allows you to kind of reductively look back through everything that you do, everything you've done and work out exactly kind of where it went wrong for the next time. That allows you to look at those things as, a, as, as maybe strengths or weaknesses for the future. How can we mitigate the risks in acting? How does this solve the problem best? How do we know this will work? How do we know this will benefit us? How do we mitigate the problems of acting is really, really important, especially from an SEO point of view, maybe even a paid point of view. If you act on something and it's not going to plan, it's really, really important that you've got a best and worst case scenario planned out. You know what the strengths and the weaknesses of your ideas are, because then you can mitigate those problems from being an issue or you can mitigate the impact of them or you can communicate with clients much better or your team much better and say hey something that something that could go wrong is this but we'll know it because of that and if it does happen we've got these plans in place to mitigate that how do we know this will work hopefully you can prove it but how will we know this will work will help clients and help teams and help everyone understand better whether or not um, they are um, uh, on track. How will we know this will work? A client will want to see results immediately. You can say to the client, hey, it's not going to be a result immediately. You're going to get a result in X month's time. How will we know this will work? Because of these strategies, these case studies, these things, these things, these things. It gives peace of mind to people. <clears throat> so a couple of examples for you then. Who makes decisions about this is a question you would ask your uh, your your um, peers, your um, hierarchical superiors, or maybe even a client, because that will allow you to, to, to um, know if there are any sign-off issues or any planning that you need to make for any kind of delays that happen in, 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 the, in a project. Uh, what are the best and the worst case scenarios? Now, you should be asking this of someone else's plan as much as your own plans, your own strategies and someone else's strategies, because it allows you to forecast things. It allows you to plan communication. It makes sure that there's clarity around any contingencies that clients might need to have in place. It allows for better, um, less stress, should we say. Where are areas for improvement? And again, you can ask this nice and openly to your teams. You can ask this of your um, selves. And if you do, you can then see that there are maybe weak areas that you can pre-plan if you need to change things based on the, the, uh, the, the, the knowledge of what success looks like. Or it allows you, again, to communicate any risks to clients. Um, when will we know it's succeeded? Well, again, 
if there are any weak areas, we can plan, we can communicate, we can change things. If we haven't got, a, if we don't know when things will have succeeded, how are we communicating whether things need to change? Why is this the best scenario? Well, are there any alternatives we haven't explored? Now, if there is a better scenario, then you should be entertaining the option to do it because in most marketing aspects, especially in digital marketing, there's probably eight or nine different ways of doing most things. So it may be the best scenario to, to act in one way for one type of client, or one type of website, or it may be a better scenario to do it with a different type uh, for a different type of website. Now it's really, really important that you don't just kind of let the I've done it this way before kind of thing happen. I always sort of say that every single agency I ever work with that says we've always done it that way. That's the kind of thing that you should put on your tombstone um, because if you don't change and you don't have alternatives and you aren't exploring other ways of doing things, you're, you're destined for failure in the long run. How questions, how do we approach this safely? <coughs> Excuse me. This allows us to, um, to see if there are any risks to say wasted spend or any kind of um, longer term risks. So how do we approach a site migration safely is a really big question. It isn't just a checklist. A site migration isn't just a checklist. And I used to do SEO, so hopefully I'm still right about that. You shouldn't just be following a site migration checklist. Um, it is it's things like how do we approach this safely that you really need to consider when it's when you're looking at uh, anything where time is a risk, money is a risk, or people are at risk, um, especially people, obviously. Um, all of this stuff, all of this thinking allows you to challenge ideas more easily because by asking these kinds of questions and having an entire team in your organization or um, uh, with clients, um, it allows for like an openness. We're all working with the same critical thinking principles, the who, what, where, when, why, how, basics kind of thing. It allows you to challenge things more easily in yourself because you can think, you know what, I've come up with the wrong idea here, but I've come up with the wrong idea. I've questioned myself. I've changed things or you do it with your team as well. So what is proper challenging? Now, challenging isn't really bad conflict if you have a team or you have a conversation with someone where you suggest an alternative to someone and it turns into an argument or it turns into some kind of uh, negative feelings then you're not challenging properly challenging properly is an art form um i'll tell you so i'm sorry but i'm not sorry there's the only one way to, to to give you this information and it's to kill some kittens with some bullet points i'm afraid so to challenge people, you do your critical thinking up front. You do all of your thinking in advance. You work out their potential arguments uh, against or for their own position, uh, which allows you to do this properly and with an open kind of accountable, trusting um, perspective on things. So challenging ideas is how the best work gets done. Uh, you need to be challenging each other all the time, but doing it properly. If you're challenging each other just to be a pain in the neck, it's not worth it. If you're challenging each other all the time to improve everyone else's processes or output or value, you're going to get more value out of everything. But the problem is once a challenge is made and then discussed and then decided on, you commit to an outcome. You have to commit to an outcome. Otherwise, people lose trust in you because you've just said, yeah, 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 yeah. And you've walked away. Um, if they just if they say likewise, yeah, 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 and walk away, but don't commit to things, then you stop challenging each other. You don't do it properly anymore. It becomes personal. Um, so commitment is key to challenging. Trust is absolutely vital because if someone's come to me and they've challenged my ideas or my thoughts and I haven't trusted them properly, then I'm not going to fully commit. Or if I do fully commit, but I don't trust them. I'm going to be kind of tiptoeing around and, and deciding, do I actually do this properly? Um, conflict like this is great for an organization. And conflict isn't fighting. Conflict isn't um, the, the, the negative kind of arguing. Conflict like this drives few, uh, new creativity, new ideas, new focus. The best businesses challenge each other. So how do you challenge people? So the first thing you do 
is you identify your challenge. And this is all the thinking up front, all the critical thinking, all of the planning, all of the research that you need to do. It can take minutes, it can take hours. It depends on what the problem might be that you're challenging. Once you've identified it, you need to be able to make your argument clear. It can't be ambiguous. It has to be quite concise. It has to be really clear. It has to be, um, uh, you have to use language which allows the person to realize that they're being challenged properly. Um, then you share your reasons for having a different perspective. Now, you can't just say, this is the thing that I have a problem with, or that's the problem. You have to explain why you think that. It might be a feeling, but you have to be able to articulate it properly. And you have to explain it openly. You can't just say, I just don't like it, or I've seen it done the wrong way before, and that's the wrong way. <clears throat> you have got to be, if you're making a challenge, you have got to be able to offer alternatives. The only time when you can't, you don't have to offer alternatives is if you say, okay, I don't agree with this thing. I'm not sure why. Shall we talk about it? That's when you're doing the alternative offering aspect collaboratively. That allows a bit more trust and openness. And you might realize halfway through that kind of challenge that actually you've been wrong in your original thinking. But for the most part, you should come to a challenge with someone with alternatives or at the very least the the, the the mental mechanics to allow for, for alternatives to happen. You've got to openly discuss things and you've got to come to an agreement. You have to come to an agreement. You'll be coming at something from one or two different perspectives. So coming to an agreement is absolutely essential. And then you move forward in a committed direction. Okay. So here's an example. I disagree with the plan strategy for this client. Based on working with this client in this space before, X route is better. We should try looking at this route because it caters for X, Y, Z issue that's in your strategy. So you can see here at, the po at this point, I've identified the challenge. I've explained why I think this is different. And I've explained why I think my alternative helps them. What do you think? If you ask, what do you think? Or do you, uh, what questions do you have? And it's a what question. What questions do you have? What do you think? What is your perspective? Then you're essentially saying, I'm open. I'm ready to, to, to be challenged properly. And then you say, let's agree, depending on which way it might be. You can win an argument or a challenge by losing because you've done it properly. You walk away. There's no animosity. Everyone likes each other still, and you feel great. So the problem is, though, this only works when you listen properly. If you're being challenged, you have to listen properly. It's very hard because we all think our ideas are the best, uh, especially mine. Um, you have to trust each other. If there isn't the right level of trust, then it's not going to work for you. You have to actually commit to a course of action and you have to truly close the matter once it's been decided. Now, when I say actually commit to the course of action and truly close the matter, I'm not saying that immediately after a challenge, you're going to suddenly change all of your plans and you're going to not feel a bit bruised from having your, your ego challenged. But you should realistically, you know, an hour or so later, maybe a bit later than that, be able to have a nice conversation with that person, have a coffee with them, have a chat, go to lunch, whatever you would normally do with that person. You shouldn't have a personal, um, feel like a personal attack has happened. If that happens, you're not doing the challenging process properly. It also doesn't work when you think you're too smart to discuss the issue. This is my uh, way of doing it. This is the right way of doing it. I know better because I've done this for longer than you. The amount of times that you hear that in, in, in digital marketing and it's stifling an awful lot of potential new um, uh, blood into the industry who would be fantastically creative who don't know and don't want to ask questions online of their peers because they the, the, their peers think they're too smart to discuss alternatives. Um, if you think you're best or the idea is best just because it's yours, unless you're me, of course, um, then um, it's not going to work. Just because it's your idea doesn't mean it's the best idea. Yes, you might have had a lot of time up front doing a lot of thinking, but someone else who has different experience, different perspective, different culture, different background, different upbringing, they may have a different way of looking at it, which actually might help you if you open your mind and listen. If you offer a false commitment just to appease or end the conflict, it's going to go wrong for everyone because that person will see that you haven't kind of followed what you committed to and they won't trust you later. And also 
everyone kind of loses because you have to put effort into something that you're not going to do properly. Now, I always sort of suggest that, for example, if you're taught, <clears throat> if you're looking at going in two different directions and one person says route A is faster, someone says route B is faster, you have a good com- bit of conflict, you have a bit of challenge, and then you decide that route B is the faster route, even though you really think route A is the faster route, if you walk on route B and you drag your feet and you walk slowly and you make it last longer and you do all these things that make going on that route B slower and then you get there and you go, see, I told you, you've just broken trust with that person. You've broken the point of doing this. If you take things personally because someone thinks differently from you, I advise finding a cabin in the woods and staying there forever because there are eight point something or other billion other people who think differently to you. Um, Find a place to hide because the world won't worry. Um, Critical thinking unlocks a lot of things. It unlocks more fully formed thinking. It allows you to make better, um, more professional challenging of ideas without causing any conflict. It also then, because you can do it this way, it unlocks the right kind of trust, accountability. And quite importantly, with lots of things that happen in, in digital marketing, it makes focus happen. You can focus on things because you've had a good discussion and a good bit of thinking and a good challenge with someone else. It stops context switching. Now, if you want to know what context switching is, ask me afterwards because it's a really um, powerful, painful uh, and uh, resource expensive thing. And if you're doing critical thinking up front, you context switch less. It allows for better task planning as well. Who has heard of the Eisenhower matrix? Uh, it's not this guy. Um, well, it is that guy, but it's not the actual matrix. Um, so the Eisenhower matrix is a really good way of task planning and it, and and Critical thinking and challenging comes very deeply into this. So this is the matrix, like a four box system. You have important and urgent in the top left. You have not urgent and not important in the bottom right. Okay. So in the urgent and important, that's the do stuff. That's the usually unplanned, usually very reactive. That's the oh crap moments in the week. That's the uh, oh my gosh, I wish someone had actually uh, asked for help bits. That's the it's suddenly very important and I really, really, really need some help. Um, The not urgent but important is the plan area. This is where everyone should live. And if everyone did lots of thinking up front, challenged ideas with people and went slow to go fast, you would live in the plan area. The plan area, I don't know how many, (laughs) many other ways I can say this, you should live in this box. This is planning strategies. This is planning apps output this is planning your day this is planning other people's days this is creating briefs this is delegating things this is um this is the bit where you're um you're not suddenly reacting to something this you you even down to like basic level of cortisol will will will, will diminish and you'll feel healthier just because you live in a planned state the urgent but not important is things that are um usually delegatable um, you delegate them through the right structure. You delegate them in the right way. They're important. They're they're not important enough that they would cause uh, damage, but they are important enough to get done. Um, they are urgent enough to get done right now, but they also need a proper brief. And then the not urgent, not important, depending on what that thing might well be, you would either delete it, throw it in the bin, or you would automate it. <coughs> so. Uh, For example, um, you have uh, a website with a million individual images and uh, every uh, every single um, SEO tool is telling you that they need an alt tag. Well, it is best practice. It is the right thing to do for people who are hard of sight. So you really should be doing it. But the actual value of doing it for a million images manually is really, really hard. So you'd work out a way to automate it because it isn't urgent that it gets done right now. It isn't important enough for for whatever reason you determine. So you get it done as quickly as possible, as minimally effort filled as possible. So urgent, important, this is client reactive stuff. You'll never have to deal. uh, you, You should never not have this. <laughs> there will always be something when a client sends an email that says, hey, just so you know, our site went live today. And you go, oh, oh no, I've got to get on with something. Or someone's suddenly off sick and you've got to pick up some work or a meeting of theirs. Um, 
in the plan stage, this is your planning of your tasks, your challenging of ideas, you're thinking things through, you're less context switching, less effort, less resource, better value, slow to go fast. The urgent but not important, this is where you form um, fully formed briefs, you deliver those briefs to teammates, you delegate properly, and proper delegation is a skill, it's an art. Um, and then the not urgent, not important is the thinking things through means more automations. If you think things through better, you probably can automate most things, especially with all the, the cool technology that's coming out right now. Tools are coming out like every single day that automate an awful lot of stuff. Um, automating things is the, is, is, is the byproduct of thinking things through properly. You've heard, hopefully have heard of the term garbage in, garbage out. Garbage in means... You put some rubbish thinking in, you get rubbish thinking out or rubbish output. Now, if you do lots of thinking up front about how to automate certain tasks that are in the not urgent, not important box, you can probably create some, some significantly quality, uh, uh, good quality uh, automations. So a few examples. It's raining. This is important and urgent. It is raining and there is a hole in the roof. Everyone's getting wet. Everyone's angry at me for for getting to, to fix the hole in the roof or not getting the hole in the roof fixed and it's now raining. It's important, but it's not urgent. So there's a hole in the roof, but because it's summer and I'm in England right now, it's raining all the time because it's England, but it's summer and there's a hole in the roof. No one's angry with me yet, but it's important that I get it fixed. It's not urgent because no one's getting wet right now. Import, not important, but urgent is that there's a crack in the roof and it could get worse. It's urgent to sort out, but it's not important because it's just a crack and there's no risk right now of any kind of harm. Uh, not important and not urgent is that there's a Frisbee stuck on the roof. Now, who knows how a Frisbee causes a crack, which causes a hole, which gets everyone wet, which gets me in trouble. But if you look at it from this point of view, it's not important and it's not urgent. I've binned it, I've delegated it, I've thrown it away, uh, and I've not dealt with it. If I automate it, then that's me calling someone and asking them to, to, to look at it and get the Frisbee off the roof. If it's not important and not urgent, I've delegated it and I've said, uh, it's not important but urgent, sorry. I've delegated it. I've called someone who's gone and fixed the crack in the roof and taken the Frisbee away, hopefully. It's very hesby, he heavy, damaging Frisbee. Um, if it's uh, important but not urgent, I've gone around, I've got some quotes from builders, someone's come and fixed the hole in the roof, it's done properly. Um, and if it's important and urgent, none of those things have happened because it's suddenly reactive because it's just been left, it's not been thought about. So from a, um, a digital marketing point of view, important and urgent is a client site just went live and we haven't done any of the 301 redirects. Important but not urgent is we need to audit the new site to plan the redirects. Not important but urgent would be we need to talk to the developers to brief them. So it's not important right now, but it is urgent that we talk to them before any work gets done on the website. Uh, it's not important and not urgent that the client sent an email with their new logo on it and said, hey, what do you think of this? Now, if you look at this from a it's not important and it's not urgent at all, bin it, then you might be missing an opportunity because adding critical thinking and challenging to this might go, hmm, why are they doing a new logo? Could that turn into a new website? Maybe we should talk to the developers and then we should do this and then we should do that. Let's think it through properly, okay? So now what? What happens, what happens now? You get your team trained, hopefully, or yourselves. Everyone should be singing from the same hymn sheet. Everyone should learn these principles as best as possible. If you're all talking the same language in the critical thinking, the challenging and the importance and urgency mindset perspective, everything runs more smoothly. There is a lot less stress. Even the person that annoys you in the team annoys you less, but professionally. You need to practice what you preach. You really, really need to practice what you preach here. Now, if you uh, don't uh, allow someone to challenge you properly because you're having a bad day, you can say, hey, look, I'm not having the best of days. Can we talk about this tomorrow? It's not the most important and urgent thing right now. Keep using the same language with each other, challenging, critical thinking, context switching, um, important, urgent, et cetera. If you use those that language throughout uh, your day, your week, your month, then you're showing your team and you're showing your peers and you're showing your bosses that you are um, 
practicing this and then when a challenge comes along you're more likely to trust each other this is a process with teams and it's a process with people because like i've said everyone is different everyone comes from different places even if you live down the road from someone and you've known them your whole life and you went to the same school and you had the same teachers and everything you did was exactly the same you're still different people so this is a process where you have to learn to understand that other people think differently and when you challenge people better that's the way to do it so stay positive when things don't go well hold strong though because sometimes it will go wrong sometimes a challenge will hurt someone personally a little bit maybe you'll have done it wrong or maybe they'll have not been in the right frame of mind but hold strong you will need to maybe sort of take a step back at that point and say hey i'm really sorry i've not didn't mean to upset you didn't mean to uh, to, um, to 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 say it that way or or whatever um, perspective you might have there. Um, I'm here if you need anything. Um, you can get in touch with me after the, after the talk. You can get in touch with uh, the guys at the conference here. Um, and uh, and 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 if you if you know if you want to um, screenshots of the the who what when when why how type questions, um, you can ask them. Um, just just come and get some help because. This does make massive differences in teams. It helps you refine processes. It makes your processes less uh, um, arduous. It makes you less stressed. It makes your clients stay with you longer. It makes the results you bring more fulfilling. It means that at the end of delivering these results to clients they or, 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 or stakeholders, uh, there is a now what next there is a uh, there's another layer to this there's another opportunity for you to say we are going to do these 10 things up because this has been possible so you know we're going to create a new section on your website cool that's done next problem no we're going to create a new section on your website which allows us to then start doing things like transcriptions of your content that you do um on uh, on stages or events and things like that that will allow us to have more internal linking opportunities or whatever else it might be it allows those clients to go wow these guys really know what they're talking about these people are people we should stay working with these people think things through the people i work with think things through if i think things through and they think things through and we talk to each other with trust and empathy and we talk to each other having done the right critical thinking up front everyone feels better it just helps everyone i think that went well I've got time for questions. There are um, there are probably some questions, I suspect. If not, that's great. We can all uh, uh, calm down. Um, if anyone wants to talk to me before um, the end of the conference, hit that little QR code. Um, if anyone wants to talk at the end of the conference, um, we we can we can talk as well. Um, but I'm I'm ready for for some questions now, Mister Mister Dapper uh, MC. I think you might be on mute there. Ah, thank you. You ID that. Whoopsie, a little bit of a slip to doodle. Uh, thank you very much for that really insightful talk coming from you. Uh, Reminded people, there is a Q&A tab. Click to it, type your questions out, and I'll relay them to Chris. I guess, you know, I'll, I'll open the field is, you know, I, I think there's a, an interesting thing to kind of like highlight here, which is, you know, critical thinking, it's tough, right? Sometimes you can kind of go past the point where it's helping and sometimes it can get a little bit more toxic. So I guess my first question to you is, you know, what is your approach to keeping uh, it balanced, right? To ensuring it remains productive, positive mm. and progressive. Yeah. There, I mean, there's, there's the, um, there's the risk, I guess what you're saying, the risk is here that uh, you might overthink something or you yes. might spend too much time or too much resource thinking something through. And I think um, there's, like I said a few times in the in the in the presentation, they go slow to go fast. It doesn't mean that you take way longer time. It just means you slow down the thinking. So as soon as you end up going into a bit of a circular argument in some respects, as soon as you come back to your original point, then you need to ask a critical thinking question essentially that says, have I not asked this before? Or did I not ask, answer that late earlier? Have I not thought this thing through properly? I'm going to stop. I'm going to walk away for five minutes. I'm going to come back and I'm going to go, oh, actually, yeah, that's solved. Um, the, the risk of doing everything in your head, obviously, is that you don't necessarily know whether you've gone around and around and around and around in circles, which is why you should 
usually, if you can, present your ideas or your thinking or your planning to someone who's willing to listen and trusts that they can challenge the thinking. And that usually means, again, slows things down, adds a day somewhere, but it's but it, it creates more value in the in the, the longer term. I guess something that also supports that is the idea of maybe kind of an iterative approach to whatever you're doing, right? Where that way you can assess, attempt, move on, as opposed to being in that kind of overthinking loop if you're you know, doing a kind of a traditional waterfall approach where everything yeah. has to be figured out for years in advance. It, exactly. And I think that, you know, if you're doing, if you, if you know um, what the leading measures of success are throughout a project, you know when you would stop, you know when you'd reassess. So just for everyone who's who's listening now, and there's a big difference between leading and lagging measures of success. A lagging measure of success would be we made the 100 sales or we didn't make the 100 sales by the, 20, uh, the 30th of March 20, uh, uh, 2023. Now, when that day comes, which is tomorrow, um, if we haven't made the 100 sales, it's too late. It's a lagging measure. We can only act in the future. A leading measure would be we need to make 10 sales a day for the next 10 days to make 100 sales. So if we're on day five and we've only made 30 sales, we now know that we're, we're, we're hitting one of the what's the worst case scenarios or what's, what's a sign that this isn't happening. So you can effectively communicate to a client. You say, OK, you want 100 sales. We can deliver that. It's going to take this time to do these things. It's going to cost this much money. These are the things that we're going to do. Risks of doing that are this. Benefits of doing it are this. But if we get to this date or this date and we haven't seen this leading indicator of future success, then we will reassess. Uh, um, to give, a, um, I guess, an SEO um, analogy would be a leading indicator of future sales may well be an increase in impressions that you're seeing in Search Console, not necessarily rankings for individual short tail sales related keywords. So you'll do a new SEO strategy, site goes live, everyone high fives each other and you walk away. Client then says six months later, still not selling anything. You say, well, the graph of impressions is going up, which is great. The keywords which we can see that you're capturing impressions for are long tail informational right now, not short tail commercial. That will come. This is a leading indicator that this is working. Now, if the opposite is true, you can then say, hey, we've got we to crack on and make some changes. Um, we have got some questions now starting to come in, so I want to field a few of those. Uh, Jack asks, how do you approach people who refuse to be challenged? Now, that, that's an interesting one because I remember earlier on, you, you brought up the idea of things like people being too smart to discuss. Mm. And maybe also you can give some examples where you've had that kind of issue and, and how you overcame it. Yeah, so um, if they're a client, it's very hard to do very much with that because either you need to keep them or you don't. If you don't need to keep them, then just say, thanks very much, goodbye. It's unlikely that that's ever an easy thing to do. So let's pretend you can't say that to a client. If you are approaching a client that has, um, I don't know if anyone's heard of the hippo complex, which is the highest paid person's opinion. Um, essentially, that's them saying, no, nope, we're doing it this way because it's our money and we're, we're important and we think this is the right way of doing it. Uh, you can do the challenging framework. You can say up front, these are the right ways to do it because, because, because here's evidence, evidence, evidence. If they say that's not the right way of doing it, then you've articulated what the right way is. You've documented it in some kind of a way. But one thing which um, critical thinking, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, critical thinking kind of unlocks negotiation skills. If you're doing the right kind of um, critical thinking, and I'm not just saying the basic who, what, where, when, why, how, you can open questions with that client. Why do you think that this is better than the suggestion that we've got evidence for? What has happened in the past that has allowed this to be the case? Or what do you want to do if this isn't working out? And when do you think that we should make changes if it isn't working out? Um, I like another aspect of this, would, sorry, another aspect of this would be something called an accusation audit. Um, it, there's, a, there's a fantastic negotiation tu uh, tuition website called the Black Swan Group. It's a guy called Chris Voss who wrote um, a negotiation book. He used to be an FBI negotiator absolutely brilliant and his voice you could like he's got the perfect radio voice um like late night radio dj style um if you if you are going to say something to someone who is unwilling to listen 
but you have to say it for ethics or morality or integrity or just because it's the right thing to to do for the for, for the results that you're trying to get do an accusation audit up front and that would be look you're not going to like what i have to say it's going to be hard to hear it's not going to sound like what you want to do but here it is because when they're hearing that thing, they're thinking, I don't want to hear this. This isn't what I want to hear. I don't like what I'm being, what's being said. They can't then come back and say, hey, I'm not, not a fan of that. They can just go, okay, fine, and then move on. Um, if it's someone in your team and you're in charge and you can find someone to replace them, replace them. You can't change those kinds of behaviors. If they're unwilling to listen uh, uh, because of ego, they're unwilling to change and that's toxic for everyone else. Everyone should be working in the same positive forward thinking way okay yeah you know, i was gonna say i like the way you know you kind of approach that whole attitude of posing a question that's really a statement right because i think there's kind of yeah. in, in these situations there's I, i'd say there's kind of three approaches from beginner to advance where the beginner is you know you ask questions mm. the middle is you make statements and then the final one is you kind of loop around to questions again that technically are statements it's just yeah. laid out in a diplomatic way right yeah, and and I th and I think if you if you can do that, there's like you're almost you're almost painting someone into a corner where they uh, have to ad at the very least admit that they might not be right, whether they take it on or not. Um, and yeah, it's it's hard though; it doesn't feel good. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I, I guess one thought, kind of coming into that, uh, is obviously you know, people come in with perceptions they have ideas the word mm -hmm. confirmation bias comes to mind do you see that as a positive with this approach because if someone has that confirmation bias and you can disprove it then your action is definitely the right way or do you think more often than not it actually gets in the way of true progress um we all want to be right um so we're always going to look for ways that we can affirm our thing as being right and uh, I think the the true strong people who are mentally strong when it comes to this kind of thinking framework are the sorts of people which can hear something which goes against what, what is said, decide to take that advice or whatever that might well be, and then de depending on how they feel, uh, they will not like it. They'll go away and they'll feel quite bad, but you're the stronger people when it comes to these sorts of things. And it is a, it's a, like a, it's a mental muscle. You, no one's ever going to like finding out that they hadn't thought things through properly. You will love it if you win a challenge and it was your idea in the first place. But, you know, if you strut around and say how, how good you are, then you're not going to make it easy for everyone else later as well. Um, it's really easy to look for things that, that um, confirm your own thoughts. So if you start going around in a circle with someone, you might need to mentally check yourself and go, am I just trying to get the pat on the back or the yes here? Because I might actually be wrong. I should probably just li listen to them. That's fair. And I think it, it's important to kind of have a cutoff point, right? Because it's that sunken cost fallacy. The more you invest in this idea, the more mm. it becomes almost a part of you that you just can't yeah. be wrong. And it becomes yeah. more difficult to let go of that. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Okay, so it uh, looks like Julian is asking, how can you encourage a critical thinking approach from a lower subordinate level? So when you're not in any real position of power. Um, I think if, if everyone in a team does this kind of training and everyone does it together, and then you consistently have an open and trustworthy, trusting um, uh, set of feedback and briefing processes in a business, a subordinate person should be challenging people and they should be asking these questions because they, I'm not saying everyone should sit there and think of different ways their boss is wrong, but they should also think of different ways that they're seeing things because they have a perspective that someone else doesn't have. Now it's hard when you're a junior because you want to, you, well, you want to progress. You don't want to upset anyone. You don't want to get fired, all those sorts of things. But if you've got a good boss who really focuses on a growth mindset and op has an open mind to critical thinking and challenging from their own peer level or from from uh, the management layer, but not from from subordinates, and they don't make it open to everyone. Then they're just following kind of a checklist that they've printed off the internet. Um, 
everyone in a in a team should go through some kind of critical thinking training and it should be very focused around you are just as important as a perspective bringer than anyone else now if the person that's um, superior to that person says uh, proves through the challenge because of their expertise or because of their knowledge that that junior was wrong that junior should still feel good that they brought something to the table and they learned something that's fair right it's kind of laying out you know this is a cool idea this could work but here's the limitations i think it also speaks to the idea of empowering uh the, not only the people that further down the ladder but also mm. i'd say um the younger the newer people the fresher minds because mm. i think I, I always remember uh, a quote by i think it's mark zuckerberg where he's like you know the half-life of a good programmer is like you know five or six years or up to 10 max right and the mm. logic there is similar to anything you do in life you start to build bad habits mm. or rather mm. they were good at the time but now yeah. they've become inefficient yeah exactly and and i think um this is where part of the challenging of ideas, if you're a junior, you don't have to have an alternative, but you have to have the me- uh, the mental um, acuity to be able to discuss alternatives. So you can say, I don't feel like that's the right thing to do, boss. What what should we do? Because I, I can see this and this and this. I don't have an alternative, but I'd love to learn how to come up with an alternative. And, you you know, that's that's the right way of doing it if they don't have the experience to be able to challenge something with an alternative. Yeah, it's, it's what you kind of stay in around the idea of essentially a diplomatic approach, right? Instead of going, sorry, you're outdated, that's stupid, we shouldn't do that. You've got to be going, okay, let, let's break this down. How can I bring them about? Why yeah. are we doing this now, right? It's almost like, um, I think there's a classic kind of uh, study that, that you with, with, uh, with growth, like past your first few years of life, the amount of questions you ask goes drastically down, right? Because mm. you start, yeah, you know, the parents, they get annoyed, right? They get annoyed to a point where it's like, okay, just stop asking these questions now. You're like, okay, yep. mommy, okay, daddy. But you need to kind of fight that urge to suppress questions you have. Because yeah. really, like, how else can you learn? Yeah. And 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 the, uh, I don't know about you, I don't know about any of the audience, but I remember when I was a, a, a young kid, I remember like sitting in the back of the car, kind of practicing the question I was going to ask my parents because I was worried that it would be just one too many questions. And then thinking, well, actually this is, is this, you know, now I'm thinking, has that held me back at certain points from being more open with other people? And this is where if you're in a position of management or leadership in, in a business, you should be saying, I want my juniors and subordinates and team and everyone in the business. When it comes to here's my idea, I'm giving the chat the idea. I'm essentially saying now bring your challenges. Um, if you're not doing that, then you're just an autocratic leader. And everyone that you work with is quite happy with being led autocratically. And that's the case in some instances, in some industries or in some cultures. No, I'm not going to lie. I was that kid who just childlessly kept asking why on repeat even uh, <laughs> past the few years right you know, just... <laughs> i'm not gonna i'm not gonna comment <laughs> oh there we go just in case mom's in the chat uh we've got a question from kate though she's asking do you think that some people who are more comfortable working more chaotically uh might have challenges with the critical thinking approach um so everyone is basically the same so i always remind myself that the 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 modern PC and the modern computer is basically built in the same uh, uh, way as our brains work. You've got the CPU, you've got the RAM, you've got the bus, you've got all of the bits inside and everything like that. Um, and you, oh, people can work um, on one problem at a time, and it might be five problems at a time, but actually you're still only, you're splitting between them as you go. People who work chaotically have just gotten very used to that, and that's not necessarily a bad thing because they're very good in the reaction issue. They're very good at problem solving. Usually those sorts of things. That's where you can use perspectives that they hold to deliver something to someone who works more planned and, uh, and programmatically. The problem with um, going, Oh, I love chaos and all that sort of stuff. What you're kind of saying is a bit like um, it's a bit like um, someone who's been in battle for years and years and years. You, it's very hard to lower that, cortisol level and lower that that tolerance to it you've you've built up the tolerance to chaos you don't just kind of somehow one day wake up and go yeah I fancy a bit of chaos i'm gonna love that and i'm gonna keep doing that forever um it's something you've learned and also something you can unlearn and similarly with people who are very very process driven 
I, I've, I've worked with some fantastic ops directors in agencies and they are great at this, this, then this, then this, then this. The second uh, a relatively large thing has been thrown into the mix reactionary, they get on with it, they deal with it, they try and work out how to process it. But the reality is they're, they're, they often freeze and they panic because something chaotic's come their way. The chaotic people freeze and panic when they're given a list. <laughs> it, I can relate to that. You know, I, like I, I think I, I've got to a point where I can benefit the two, but there's definitely that kind of feeling like, I, I think that's where usually the lead is kind of meant to be the, the middle ground, right? Like if you yeah. see the value in these chaotic people, then find ways of assigning them uh, the imminent last second type things that come out of nowhere. And then yeah. you have the people that maybe like the what the Celtic person might see as a more monotonous approach so to work. If if we look at that Eisenhower matrix, let's say for argument's sake, you love planned, ready to you you know what's coming kind of activity. You live in the in the plan box, you live in the it's not urgent, but it is important box. There will always be reactive things to do. Now, if you do lots and lots of planning, those reactive things will be less and less. If you're, you love, for some reason, you love chaos and you love things going um, at a million miles an hour, you may love being in the important and urgent box, but things will get dropped. Things will get missed. Attention to detail will sometimes be lacking because you still have the same internal clock that everyone else does. Hmm. Well, it's fair way. Oh, I just noticed, actually, like I'm going to apply my critical thinking cap here, Chris, and I'm going to say, Do it. I don't think these sessions are long enough. I think we need to extend them <laughs> next time because I think we reached our limit here. I, I noticed one or two more questions come at the end. Apologies, folks. Uh, we can get around to them. But Chris did give you a means to contact him, and I'm sure he's more than willing to continue the dialogue with you uh, behind the scenes. But Chris, absolutely, an absolute pleasure. There you go. That's up on the screen now. Scan that. Make sure you connect with him. He's a very insightful guy. Lovely chap, as you can see. And also, he definitely uh, dresses to impress, which I can always respect. Thank you Chris. very much. Thanks, everybody. Um, hope it's been as useful to you as it has been fun for me. I mean, it's definitely been fun for me. But the fun has to keep going, Chris. I'll let you go. And folks, if you just wait around a few minutes, we should be moving into our next talk shortly. But once again, thank you, Chris. And hopefully, we'll see you again soon. Thanks a lot. This is all we got Dreaming about a revolution in our minds This is all we got Lock me out of this life institution I am angry and I on illusions Yes, I hate but it's not a solution Try my best but I'm just a human Oh, we don't need to say we're sorry We don't need to worship ever sorry We don't need to say we're sorry